you know, I, I draw a picture these days comparing the forces at work on a human organization with forces at work on an aircraft. The lift of human energy, the weight of bureaucracy, the thrust of purpose, and the drag of fear. And if we're going to get our organizational aircraft off the ground every day, we better create more human energy than bureaucracy and more purpose than fear. And that simple model has really resonated with a lot of people. But then I make it personal and I say, look, when that pilot points the aircraft down the runway, gives it full throttle and it hits takeoff speed, they make this very simple little move on the yoke. They pull it back just a little bit, creating an angle between the nose of the aircraft and the earth. And that simple angle is all that it takes to get your organizational aircraft off the ground. And the name that they use in aeronautical engineering is positive attitude. And this is available to all of us literally the second you hear it. You get to choose your own attitude. You get to choose what attitude you bring to life. And you can choose a positive attitude or a negative attitude. If you want to get the people around you off the ground, be that force that you want to see in the world. Be that positive force. It's your choice. Richard Sheridan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Rich is CEO and Chief Storyteller at Menlo Innovations, which is a successful entrepreneur and author of two best-selling books, Joy Inc., How We Build a Workplace People Love, and Chief Joy Officer, how great leaders elevate human energy and eliminate fear. Rich's passion for inspiring organizations to create their own joy-filled cultures has led him to address audiences across the world through four continents and 18 countries and counting, as well as throughout the United States. What motivates Rich to travel the world speaking to tens of thousands of people in nearly every setting imaginable? What does he share with audiences that makes them jump to their feet with enthusiasm and return to their organizations on fire with inspiration? Simply this, joy. More specifically, that joy in your organizations, in your life, is not just possible, but essential, essential to profitability to productivity, to every measure of success. Rich and his message of joyful leadership have been featured in press outlets ranging from Inc., Forbes, New York Magazines, to Bloomberg, U.S. News, and World Reports, NPR, On Point Podcasts, and All Things Considered, Harvard Business Review, his videos for organization such as Gemba Academy, Vital Smarts, and Airbinger Institute continue to inspire audiences around the world. Rich doesn't just talk about joy in the workplace. He lives it every day at Menlo, the custom software and consulting company he co-founded in 2001 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Since then, Menlo has received worldwide notice for its unique culture, including recognition by Inc. Magazine as the most joyful company in America. Menlo has been recognized by the Alfred P. Sloan Award for Business Excellence and Workplace Flexibility for 11 straight years and has received a Lifetime Achievement Award for Freedom at Work from World Blue, as well as five revenue awards from Inc. Magazine. Today, people come to Menlo from all over the world, nearly 20,000 people in the past seven years alone, to learn about Menlo and how they can create a culture of joy in their own organization. Welcome, Rich. It's so wonderful to have you to the podcast. I really, really appreciate you being here and speaking with us today. Great to be with you, Mark. Thanks for inviting me into your world. I'm so glad to have you, and it's a sheer pleasure and honor, and I know we're going to have a joyful discussion today. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, I could have went on much longer with your bio because uh, you've been around the block, so to say. You've seen a lot of uh, companies and organizations. You've written the books, and you've motivated and helped people uh, change their lives and their organizations 
uh, for quite some time. That brings me to my real first question, and that is, how has all that helped you to weather this crazy time, not just the pandemic, but Black Lives Matters, unrest around the world, the election, on and on. And uh, I'm sure during this time, you've had to come up with some real crazy new ways to, to, to give people tours of, of not only your books and what you do and, and, and things, but uh, it's been different. Can you give us an update and kind of insight? Yeah, I, I'm reminded of, uh, I don't know if you, if this was an original quote, but something John Lennon of the Beatles once said that life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do other things. And I think that defines 2020 for just about all of us. We had big plans for this year. This was going to be our best year ever. We were going to ring all the bells of revenue and tour guests and all that kind of stuff. And we, we were executing incredibly well on it through January and February. And then all of a sudden, everything just stopped, right? Stopped in an instant. Uh, as you know about our culture, we value being together in a big room with no walls, offices, cubes, or doors. And suddenly, everybody's at home cobbling together their own home offices. And I'll tell you, it really knocked the pedestal out from under me. I hit. I think I hit the whole floor faster than and harder than the rest of my team. And I wondered, would we survive? Would we make it through this? Would we be able to adapt quickly enough, given everything that it hit us? And of course, back in March, we thought, oh my gosh, the pandemic, that'll be the big thing. And then, as you said, Black Lives Matter, uh, broader social justice issues, uh, the, the election, uh, the, the climate onslaught that we've been going through. I mean, so many things are hitting us this year. And I will tell you the thing I learned uh, over and over again throughout the course of this year is how important it was for us to have built this strong foundation of an intentional and intentionally joyful culture. And resting what we had to now do to adjust based on that cultural setting was critical. Uh, I used to think that having an intentionally joyful culture was important. Now it's critical. And, uh, you know, so that lesson has come home for me again and again and again, particularly as I've watched our team adapt over this year and adapt so quickly and quite frankly, adapt faster than I did, which was a delight to watch and very that, comforting. That's beautiful to hear. And thank you for sharing that honesty. Um, a lot of people I speak to, I speak to a lot of innovators, a lot of futurists, a lot of people who are speaking about the future of work um, that were really caught off guard. The, 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 the wind was knocked out of their sails. Uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, they've had to shut down. They've just uh, uh, didn't have that, <clears throat> that support or that, um, resilience or that extra little bit in storage so to say to to weather this long year and uh, as you said it so uh, nicely this this year really started out with a bang for me i was at the world economic forum and uh, had done this big tour at the beginning of the year and it was the decade of action we were going gangbusters and there was things coming out and plans uh, this year that were just amazing. And then this, this really took the wind out of our sails for everybody. And uh, it's very serious. But I, I also think there was this microscopic view and bubbling to the surface of a lot of holes or problems in our systems and in the way we do things and where we could do better, where we could improve more. And, and, and truly, those things that we speak about um, Put those into practice and make sure we have this solid infrastructure, this uh, this uh, safety net for uh, to get through times like these, because we'll, we'll probably be experiencing some more in the future. I don't want to say dystopian, but we need to be prepared to change the way we work in the future. And, and that really leads me to uh, something I kind of tickled is uh, how. How have you guys done it? What kind of shifts have you done? What what uh, are there some positive stories that have come out of it? I can, t I can tell you uh, from my own experience, because I talk a lot about sustainability, about the environment, climate, uh, resilience, biodiversity, food, and those things. 
boy, my phone, uh, the March was ringing off the hook. My projects have tripled and people are saying, we're sorry, we didn't listen. We want to, can we get your help? We got to turn up some new, new ways of working and things. And, and so I'm sure you experience the same, same, ex, same things as well. Well, this is certainly a time to test leadership. And I don't mean just top leaders like me, but leadership throughout the organization. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when all of this first hit, uh, I was fortunate enough to have heard about and then attended a virtual conference put on by Patrick Lencioni. He called Emerge Stronger. And in that conference, as I listened to the messages he was delivering, he, he offered up a couple of almost trite, but so powerful uh, hypotheses. He said, number one, uh, obviously, as we enter into this headwind, and strong one at that, hurricane force headwind, uh, companies are either going to survive or they're not, right? Kind of a basic thing. And as you said, a lot of them have not, unfortunately. But those that survive, the difference is going to be, are you going to emerge stronger from this or are you going to emerge weaker from this? And that is actually a conscious choice of leadership. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, what can we do to emerge stronger from this? And we worked together as a team to come up with a rallying cry of thrive again. But not just a poster on the wall that says we'll get back to doing good things someday, but a five-step model that we would be able to actually chart our progress along the way. So the number one, as probably almost all of us went through, survive. We had to make a lot of tough decisions together as a team to just simply survive because survival for a business literally amounts to cash in the bank. What, what can we do to just hoard cash, which is what everybody does when they're in that kind of fearful place. So we cut rates, we cut hours, we cut you know everybody back, including the founders. Founders just went to zero pay and that sort of thing. And uh, so I think that spirit of shared sacrifice was very important in the early days. And then the second phase is adapt, right? We had to make changes. So this work in one big room together, sharing computers, uh, you know, switching pairs because we work in pairs at Menlo, all of this had to adapt to a work from home environment. The work from home environments that people had to cobble together as quickly as possible so we could get back to our jobs. So that adaptation phase happened within days of us all having to be pushed out of the office in an instant, unexpectedly, of course. Um, <clears throat> then the next step is sustain. How do we get to that place where it feels like we're safe enough that, hey, we're not, we're not cruising along, we're not taking off like a rocket ship, but boy, we're, we're keeping our heads above water and we're doing it sustainably. And then finally, emerge stronger, which is the phase we're in right now. And I'll talk about some of the things we're doing that are direct evidence that we are absolutely going to emerge stronger from this. There will be things that will change at Menlo going forward that are born out of this time that we will never go back to the way things were exactly. We'll go back to some of the ways things are, but there's so many good things that are coming out of this. It would be silly to ignore the things that we're, we've gotten stronger in this time. And then finally, at that point, there will come a day, and we're not there yet, where we will thrive again. We, we fundamentally believe that. We see it in the numbers. We see it in the activity. Uh, we're by no means you know, perfectly safe, uh, nor is anyone right now. We don't know what else is coming. 2020 keeps delivering <laughs> one thing after another, but, uh, but we've at least proven to ourselves with as hard as all the body blows have been through this year that we've hung together as a team. And uh, you know, happy to talk about some of the very specific things we've done through 2020. That if, goes if you uh, if you don't mind, I would love to hear about those. My listeners would as well, and how you guys, you know, plan to emerge stronger and some of the specifics. Uh, that that would be great as well. We can touch upon them now, uh, and, then, and then I want to take a couple of other subjects as we transition a little bit into your books and and kind of get into uh, some other more deeper subject matters. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that has been a hallmark of Menlo since its founding in 2001 is um, the cultural intention of Menlo to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology, literally return joy to technology, to the people who use it, 
that's what we do for a living is we create technology. We want to delight the people we intend to serve. And we think the things we're doing are so different and so interesting and fundamentally important to advancing the cause of our industry. We had opened our doors to the world right from the beginning. Come in, see us, ask us questions. We're not going to keep anything we're doing a trade secret. If we want to end human suffering in the world as really as technology, we can't do it by ourselves. We're not big enough for that. So we will share what we've learned with everyone through tours and through classes. So people would come, as you mentioned in the opening remarks, by the thousands every year. We plan to host 5,000 visitors this year at Menlo alone. People getting on airplanes, traveling from all over the world, booking hotel rooms right near our office, spending anywhere from hours to days with us, learning about our culture, our practices, taking ideas back with them to transform their own organizations. We didn't have to do this. This wasn't a necessity for our business to share what we're learning with the world, but our purpose is beyond just the work we do for our clients. We wanted to change the world. And this I, ability to open can, our doors and do that was- Can important. I uh, just interrupt you there for just one second? I want you to keep going. I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but um, I don't know. I know a lot of my listeners know, but I don't know um, You know what, what your uh, affinity or your knowledge is on this. I'm sure you've heard about it. Tony Shea passed away over Thanksgiving, uh, Zappos, a uh, famous company for around culture. They also uh, produced a book, uh, I believe it was called The Happiness Book. I have a copy yeah, here. Delivering Happiness. Delivering Listen. Happiness. I have a copy here on my shelf. I have a couple of their annual book, uh, Delivering Happiness Book, I have here on, on my shelf. And, and uh, not only is it tragic, we lost him um, due to do a fire during Thanksgiving. But they also did that exact same thing, gave tours of, of um, he left Zappos in 2017, but um, as thought, but was still involved. But they gave tours, you know, every single day and they had a specific people involved and kind of give behind the same scenes. And so those who, who know Tony's story, you guys are doing the same thing. You guys are doing on a, on a different scale, different different company, but also in that same respect and so uh, th that that's a that's a big thing it's important to get that behind the scenes views and there's many many companies who are doing it right they want to give back they want to show those examples to the world and i believe that's what you guys are doing as, as well and so I, i'll let you continue but i just thought it would be appropriate to recognize that that uh that's the level of p uh, uh, of type of person you are and menlo is as well to to rally around um, what you're doing good for the world, to give examples of how business and, and workplaces can be different. Yeah, and I will say that Tony Shea was a hero for me. Uh, it was such a great example. He changed the world in ways that will be felt long after his passing. Uh, we lost him way too soon. Uh, he had so much more to give us. And uh, I was just, it really hit me hard when I read about him met him twice. Zappos actually invited my co-founder and I to come visit them to take a tour, but also to ask us about our culture and what we had learned along the way, because that was the, that is the type of organization that Tony created. Zappos is a culture that isn't just, we've got all the right ideas. They were always in learning mode. They were always saying, maybe we can find out something uh, that can improve us from someone else. And I appreciate that kind of humility because none of us have all the answers. I mean, we don't even know what all the right questions are most of the time as leaders. Yeah, and so the humility they showed in, in honoring James and I when we came to visit and ask us deep questions about the things we've done at Menlo uh, was just an incredible honor for he and I. That's great. I appreciate you touching on that. I think there's just so many cross cuttings. And as we get further after you explain what you guys are doing, I, I want to kind of get further into that, that thinking, because there are pockets of groups, people around the world with those similar missions or those similar uh, projects. And I want to kind of touch on how they've influenced you and how they cross collaborate. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I will say that, um, you know, I think it was true at Zappos and certainly true at Menlo. Um, our tours and our classes that we teach about our culture are not in any way trying to tell anyone else in the world, you should make your business look like mine. That's not the intent. 
It's not our heart. It's not what we're trying to share. But I think when you read books on culture, if you read about company culture, if you read about, you know, all the great academicians who talk about the importance of culture, every once in a while, I think somebody who's reading one of the book, one of those books says to themselves, you know what? It'd be really, it'd be really neat to see an example right about now, to dive in deep, to be able to dig my hands in the soil of that organization, look around every part of it and see how it operates, see how it actually functions. And that's really what the purpose of our tours are. Not to come see us, let us show off how we're doing. Come ask us questions. Maybe you can take away a few ideas from us that you can embed in your own environment. But the cultural journey is a very unique journey. Every company, shouldn't get there by copying someone else's culture. They should get there because they believe in something so deeply. They want to create and custom fit a culture to their fundamental beliefs. But seeing how others have done that, like Zappos and Menlo, I think is a very powerful way to inspire you. Because I think a lot of times when people are on that journey of, uh, of, it's a tough journey to build your own culture. It's a scary journey. You don't know if you're going, should I go right? Should I go left? Which fork in the road should I take? I feel alone here. Is there anybody else who's thinking like I am? And until you see actual examples, you might think you're crazy. You might think that there's no way I should do anything like this. I, who else has done anything like that? Who else has thought the same crazy thoughts I have? And yet when you come see a company like us, or you can still go visit Zappos, the, the impact of Tony's life and his thinking on that company still exists today. And, you know, fortunately, the, these kind of powerful concepts can outlive the visionary leaders. And that's a powerful thing as well. Yeah, I love this quote from Tony. He said, for individuals, character is destiny. But for organizations, culture is destiny. And that is a strong reminder to all of us as leaders that we can actually choose our destiny by choosing what kind of culture we want to build. And the way I differentiate it is, Every company has a culture. It's the leader's choice whether that culture is intentional or what I call default, which is who do we hire? What behaviors do we tolerate? What attitudes walked in the door this morning? And that's your culture of the day. But an intentional culture, and I will expand it just a little bit in my context, an intentionally joyful culture can be very powerful. And so, back to kind of the adaptations, the emerging stronger for Menlo. Um, you know, we opened our doors to the world. We were gonna have 5,000 visitors come through this year. And all of a sudden, you know, by March, everything stopped. And it looked like it was gonna stop for a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of value in that we get from the tour guests that come. We learn from them too. And so it felt very unnerving, both to be at home and not have anybody coming and visiting. And then around about June 5th, one of my friends from another organization called, wanted to know how we were doing. How have you guys adapted? They knew that this had to be a big change for Menlo given you know, all being apart. And I asked him, I said, well, would you like to see? And he said, what do you mean? I said, how about if we do a virtual tour of the virtual Menlo? And he said, you can do that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> we can try it. Let's run the experiment. Let's see what happens. And so we did. And on June 5th, we did the first virtual tour of Memo. And it was so successful that they put a very nice blurb on LinkedIn about their time with us. And we answered that with a reply that said, by the way, if any of your friends want to come in a tour, click here. Here's the link. Well, I'm happy to say we've done well over 100 tours since June 5th. We've touched since June 5th alone. We have touched 40 countries and 30 states here in the United States just in five months. It's incredible to think of the impact we've had just in five months, all virtually, stuff we've never done before. And when I see that, and if you'd asked me a year ago, hey, Rich, what do you think? You think you should offer virtual tours? I'm like, why bother? I'm not even sure they'd work. You know, we've never done anything like that before. And how many times as leaders have we ever said, well, we've never done anything like that before. Maybe we shouldn't try. Well, we had to try. We wanted to try. 
our spirit now is turn up the experiment dial, try new things, see what works, see what doesn't. And I'm so proud of my team for what they've accomplished during this time. I'm so proud of how they just jumped in both feet and said, no, no, we're going to make this work. And to see the impact we're already having. And I know going forward, when we can get back to the office, when we can all be in close proximity to one another, the virtual tours will not stop. We would have never had to, we would have never had the opportunity to reach a worldwide audience like we have now. People who can't maybe ever afford to get on an airplane, spend the time it would take to get to the Detroit Metro Airport, drive to Ann Arbor, book a hotel room, spend a few days with us, and then go back. But now I gave a talk in South Africa this morning to 125 people. I got up this morning at normal time, walked down to the same office I'm sitting in now, gave a keynote speech to 125 people in South Africa, and then back to work, and I'm here with you today. Two hours later, I'm in Hamburg, Germany. <laughs> so yep. it's amazing what we can do now, even if we'd never thought that it would work in the past. Yeah, uh, we, we definitely are progressing more towards uh, the future of work in some respects, uh, the future of possibilities of true global societies, communities, um, uh, a different form of digital democracy in some, some forms, kind of a, a connectedness that uh, we are having on a different level. Um, in some respects, I have to joke or tease a little bit. I, I've done so many Zoom calls since uh, way before the pandemic ever, but e now even more intensively. Uh, I get the feeling sometimes of the Hollywood squares or the Muppet show type of with all these squares and boxes, you know, <laughs> pages of pages of, you know, these Brady Bunch type of squares of people sitting in, in this framed box uh, speaking to each other. But there are some been some really wonderful connections. And I think that to, to hear a voice, to see a movement, to be able to somehow look in, into people's eyes and in some respect that they're is still that possibility to, to make a shift, to make an impact and to, uh, to gain some knowledge in that. And we're also learning how we work and, uh, when it's virtual, when it's a, over uh, a Zoom or a video call and uh, what some of the things we need to do to improve, to kind of shift our attention and awareness. Uh, we'll, you know, we've heard and I'm sure you've heard this as well, is that people are working harder, working longer hours, they're not taking enough breaks, they're not getting away from behind the screens. And, you know, there's, uh, they're getting this closer look at their human zoo that they've created for themselves, which has now become their office. And they're like, some people are going stir crazy, domestic violence, or now they've got to figure out how to be the teacher to their children who are using the home computers and all this other stuff. And so there's a lot of things that are bubbling to the surface that really interject to the bottom line of, of what your mission or goal is to show people to have joy at work, to create joy in your life and, and all that you do, uh, not only because it's essential, but also what kind of human zoos have we created? Is it a place that we want to be just a few hours a day to sleep and eat and then go back to work? Or is it a place that we could spend, you know, in a bigger time and, and how good of a job have we done creating that? And so there's a, there's probably numerous things that, that we're rediscovering, but it's not going back to normal or going back to usual business as usual. It's, it's a great reset. And I like how you emerging stronger and better and, and, in a, in a different way that we don't want to go back in some respects because we were um, we're doing it a little bit wrong and inefficient and also lacking in, in that joy or in that true thing. Uh, I just had a conversation not too long ago that um, you know we used to have lifestyle and living combined with our work for for you know in, in history. And then we separated the two. We go work in an office, we go work for the man, and then there's this home time. And uh, they're almost competing jobs, competing organizations uh, in, in some respects. And, and there's a lot of lives, right? Yeah. We have work life and we have our yeah. home life. And, yeah. and we tried to keep that bright line between them. And we, we lost a lot of our humanity in that. 
Yeah, so ex exactly. And so the, with, with that, and there's many, many philosophies or thoughts, trains of thoughts out there. And that's kind of where I, I, I want to pick up and, and get your journey, uh, you know, on how, how you wrote your books and how you decided there was some things that you were doing something you loved, and then it shifted away from that. But also in that journey, I wanted to ask you, um, did you belong or join any networks like the Genius Network? Did you read books like Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, uh, you know, The Science of Gritting Rich, Wall Street Waddle, so you look, Who Moved My Cheese, or The Fish Books, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's some newer ones like um, Roma Roma Business Romantic as in one from Tim Lieberich, which is new, or Reinventing Organizations from Frederick Laloux, or Work Rules by Laszlo Bock uh, are, are, are some kind of the newer ones. But there's numerous books out there about changing the way we work, how we play in teams, and how we work in teams, and how we see our, our work lives, good to great, uh, um, et cetera, teal businesses. Uh, um, and then we mentioned it, uh, Delivering Happiness. Were any of those groups or thought leaders or those types of businesses uh, in influential to you uh, on, on that journey? And I'll kind of turn it over and be let you, be kind of broad for you to take us on that journey as well. Yeah, I I uh, in my second book I talk about that leaders are readers and readers are leaders. And I think for me, there came a certain point in my career trajectory where my, my escape route from the pain I was living was were authors and books. Uh, I started out writing code as a programmer. That was, my, that was my early life. I touched a computer for the first time when I was just a kid in high school, way back in 1971. I can't believe that was almost 50 years ago now. And by 1973, I'd won an international programming contest. So it was clear that I was excited about this. I was pretty darn good at it. And that contest win actually landed me my first job as a programmer before I was even old enough to drive a car. And I couldn't believe that people would pay me to do this thing. I simply love to do as a hobby. I eventually got degrees from the University of Michigan in computer science, computer engineering, and a lovely career was launched. One that by all world measures looked perfect. Raises, promotions, stock options, greater authority, bigger team sizes, higher title. Went from programmer in 1982 to vice president of R&D in 1997. And so it looked perfect. But, and it was a big one, I didn't want to be in it anymore. By my mid-30s, I literally wanted out the chaos of the software industry, the bureaucracy that tried to tamp down the chaos was killing my spirit, killing the spirit of the team who worked for me. And the, the really sad part was all of the attempts to fix the chaotic versions made it worse, not better. It demoralized the people who worked for me because now you're layering on all of these rules and bureaucracy on top of it. And I was literally contemplating just exiting. There was just simply a reality that I would come home to every night that says, no, you can't. My wife, my three girls, my house, my car payments. I had built a nice life out of this career. It just wasn't one I wanted to live in anymore. And so in that moment of a deep trough of disillusionment, I had to make a choice, get out or change it. And the journey out wasn't short, it wasn't fast, but it was inspirational. And it did lead me to authors and books that were hot commodities at the time, and they're still classics today. Books like Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence, and the ones that followed. Peter Drucker's books on management. Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline on the Art and Practice of Building a Learning Organization. I knew I needed that. But inside that book, it talked about the importance of systems thinking and how systems, if they're going to behave well, need short communication and feedback loops. And most of the communication and feedback loops in the companies I worked in were inexorably long. Well, the trouble with long feedback loops is they typically have the opposite effect of what you're desiring. 
I mean, let's pick an easy one that almost all of us have been subjected to somewhere in our careers, the dreaded annual performance review process, right? We're going to wait one year to give you feedback on the previous 12 months, and that's going to have some beneficial side effect on me as an employee? No, it's probably going to demoralize me because I'm going and thinking I exceeded expectations. And you were like, well, only 3.7% of you can exceed expectations this year. So we're going to make sure we find 18 things that you did wrong this year that we didn't tell you about six months ago. Like, wow, really? So this journey out was a struggle for sure, but at least gave me hope. And the hope inspired me to stick with it. And then around 1999, two years after I became VP of r and I met a guy who's now my co-founder, James Goble. I brought him in as a consultant to help teach my programmers some technical things. And he asked me why, what problem I am, am I trying to solve? I said, well, the problem is they don't know these technical things. He said, no, that's a solution, not a problem. Tell me what the problem is. And when we got into deeper philosophical discussions, he said, the technical things you want me to teach aren't going to solve that problem, Rich. We have to take a whole different approach. I blinked. I listened. We became peer partners in making a transformational change inside that tired old public company. And over the next two years, from my perch as a VP, I reinvented that public company. And I'd probably still be there to this day if the internet bubble hadn't burst in 2001 and everything got swept away. <laughs> Uh, the company I worked for had been purchased. The California company that now owned us had to shutter every remote office they had. And literally in 2001, I lost everything except one thing. They could not take away what I had learned in those two years. And they couldn't take away the relationship I would built with James Goble. And I went to him and I said, we can do this again. Let's pick up the pieces and parts. Let's take the things we learned over the last two years and let's start a new company. We'll call it Menlo Innovations. And that's what we've been doing since, since 2001 with this incredible focus on joy. And the joy message didn't really spring out fully until Simon Sinek started telling us to start with why. Yep. And people who knew me well, who'd heard me speak, because I'd already been a public speaker at that point, they sent me the video, his TEDx Puget Sound Talk with his three simple pictures of, you know, most companies know what they do. Some know how they do it, but almost none of them ever Golden speak. Golden circle, yeah. Yep. And when he shared that with me, he said, Rich, you do this. And I was convicted because I thought to myself, no, I don't. Somebody came in to visit Menlo. I'd say, welcome to Menlo. We're a software design development firm. That's what we do. We have some unusual practices. This is how we do it. Come see it. I probably inferred the why and people who heard my passion could feel the why, but I never said it explicitly. And more importantly, I never started with why. So after I saw that video, I was convicted. And I, I, lead, I was at the time, I mean, we do one to three tours a day of Menlo. At the time I was doing most of them. This was back about 2009 or so. And, um, so this group's forming, and I thought, today's the day. I am going to start with why. I don't know what I'm going to say, and I'm seldom at a loss for words, but today's the day. And I started pacing as this group is forming. I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What's the first thing I'm going to say? And right there, waiting for me like a gift, was our mission statement. And it said, our mission is to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. And I thought, there it is. That's our why. That's why we exist. That's what we want to do. I'm going to share with them. I want everybody who walks in our door to have the word suffering on their mind when they think of Menlo. And like, oh, wait, no, that's that's not it. Like, well, suffering, really? That's what you want people thinking about? And right down at the bottom, just waiting for me like a gift. I'd never seen it in the way that I saw it that morning. I said, our goal since 2001 in our founding is to return joy to technology, to the people who build it, to the people who use it, to the people who pay for it. I thought, that's it. It's that simple. So this group comes in. I'm standing there in front of them. Some of them had probably been before because we get a lot of repeat guests. Maybe they brought their friends along. And I said, welcome to Menla. You've come to a place that has very intentionally focused its culture on the business value of joy. And they are all looking at me like, what are you talking about? 
And I said, he said, Rich, we're here to learn about your practices, how you do stuff, your culture. Why are you talking about joy? And I pointed back to the room we were about to go visit, the room full of people. And I said, guys, pretend like our customers do. Pretend you're bringing us a software project that you want us to execute really well on. Pretend for some odd cultural reason, the right half of the room has joy and the left half doesn't. Which half do you want working on your project? I said, well, we want the joyful half, of course. I said, why? What difference would it make? Why would you care? I said, well, they produce better results. They'd be more engaged. They'd, they'd produce more value in a shorter period of time. They, they'd be easier to work with. <laughs> it's a big deal in my industry. And I said, okay, so you're with me. There is, in fact, tangible business value to joy. Now, let me take you on a tour and show you how we do it. And anywhere you want, stop me and say, Rich, that thing you just described, can you draw a short straight line back to joy? And I said, I will be able to do that trivially. Stop me wherever you want. The things we do, the things we don't do, short, short straight line back to joy. And that changed everything. Eventually led to the book, the second book, uh, all the tours we do now, the thousands of people who come a year, they want, joy in their own work lives. Because if you have joy in your work life where you spend most of your waking hours, the odds you're gonna have joy at home increase dramatically. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And um, there, there are some things that you uncovered in that uh, that uh, really speak to my heart. So I do a lot for sustainability, resilience, the United Nations. I'm an expert with the World Economic Forum. I present innovations at the World Economic Forum every year at Davos, this uh, next year will be in Lucerne. And uh, I take this systems view approach to life. So I really see everything as a system, our, our bodies, our planet, our businesses, uh, um, uh, and there's good systems and there's bad systems, but uh, no bad system- Bad systems can work uh, really well for a long time. <laughs> uh, exactly, a bad system will outperform no system all any uh, all the time and so we really need some good systems and and so when you you spoke about systems i really um i, I really love it because in 2018 the entire world and all international organizations world trade organization the un the world economic forum etc world trade organization they all switched to systems dynamic modeling and the systems view approach to solving our global grand challenges. They uh, use this dyna dynamic modeling systems where, where uh, they even overlaid them in the old business value canvas that with, you know, seven years or so ago that we started to use that was really trendy um, and showing that, you know, we can really find out where the bottlenecks are, where the feedback loops are, where the, the problems are in our systems. And if we run out numerous amount of scenarios to see where the problems are and that this old linear lateral siloed approach to solving our global grand challenges just wasn't working. It hasn't been working forever. And, and the book, uh, The Limits to Growth, 1972, Don Ella Meadows, Your Grander, Steve Behrens, who, who wrote the book with the Club of Rome, was really the first world's model three, which is a computer model from MIT that discussed uh, systems thinking, dynamic modeling to solve our global grand challenges. But not only that, just to tell us where we were going to be in the, in, in the future, which you know, the second book was already beyond the limits to growth because we'd already kind of went over these limits. And so when you speak about systems and feedback loops and long feedback loops, uh, you're speaking in my heart, but then when you you combine it with your mission that you want to um, create, uh, use technology to end human suffering, to use that in good ways, I am uh, I immediately want to hear. I want to know what. Okay, what what projects have you been working on? Can you release some humdingers to me and say you know that get me excited because. That, that's really what we need, you know, uh, where our human fallibility comes in is when we can't think in systems, it's extremely hard. And so if we could augment that with some systems or some dynamic models that already have it built in that, that will get us where we try to break the system or we try to think too linear, 
um, I, I really want to hear about those solutions. I don't know if you can share those or, or, or get that excited, uh, a little bit of excitement for our listeners. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're going to break an old model, you better be ready to invent a new one because, uh, you know, it's, it's that old adage of, you know, it's very difficult for the people who got us to this spot to be the ones to change us, right? Uh, the same thinking that got us here probably isn't going to get out of the situation we're in right now. Einstein's and, problem theory, yeah. Yep, exactly. And so um, we had to invent something brand new. Uh, and you would look at it today and say, okay, so there's a little bit of sort of IDEO like design thinking in this and so on. But the change for us went right to the heart of the kind of purpose we have in this organization. And when I talk about purpose in organizations, whenever I talk about this to the world, I ask every company to answer for themselves. It's going to be unique and it's easier to ask these questions and answer, even though they sound like they're easy questions to answer. When you talk about your purpose, it should answer two questions clearly for everyone. Who do you serve and what would delight look like for them? And working backwards from that purpose kind of statement, you start to design systems to produce that kind of delight in the world. For us, the people we serve are people who don't pay us for what we do. They often will never meet us. They won't even know who we are. They are the end users of the software that we're designing and building. Typically, we're doing projects on behalf of businesses. Some businesses, I can tell you who they are, and some businesses, I can't because we're under strong non-disclosure with them. Yeah, yeah. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is delight people we will never meet, people who have to use the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds every single day. Because here's the sad part of technology, and we've all experienced it. We've gotten so used to it, it feels normal. Technology typically tortures us. We know it because every once in a while we look at someone like, why does it work like this? Did they ever talk to somebody like me? Did they ever watch anybody use their products, right? Watch some clerk at a retail store trying to figure out how to get your thing you want to buy into the cash register when it doesn't have the magic barcode label on it. And they got all these people standing in line getting frustrated with the customer who brought the thing and didn't think, how come you picked up something out of the rack that doesn't have a barcode label on it? And the poor clerks, why can't you answer the question how much this is costing? And all this kind of stuff, right? And we just see this every single day in every kind of technical thing we ever interact with. And more than anything for my team, and I will tell you, this goes to the heart. This goes back to the beginning for me. I had to soul search and ask myself, why? Why do I want to be in this profession anymore? What is it that I was seeking when I went in the first time that I was so excited about, lost sight of, became disillusioned and wanted out? But what was that thing at the beginning? And I know what it is now. It is that idea that as an engineer, I will one day create something that people love. And they love so much, they want to find me and thank me for doing it. That's it. There's no other greater joy for an engineer than to have someone who uses whatever you created find you and say, really, you, you did that? Thank you. You made my life better because of how you did this. And we get this all the time with the work we do. I'll give you one example. We worked on a scientific instrument, a device called a flow cytometer. Most of your audience will have never heard what a flow cytometer is. We didn't know what it was when the customer was asking us to build the software for it was. Well, it's a device that counts cells in fluid. It's probably being used a lot right now as we try and discover some of the cures for COVID. Typically, a flow cytometer is used for bloodborne pathogens, cancers, AIDS, various other immunological disorders. And the device pushes 10,000 cells a second past a laser imaging session. The lasers fire, the fluorescing compounds that have been added to the cells give off a light if, they're, if they have certain characteristics and the scientists can use that data to figure out whether the therapies they're creating are actually having an effect on the cancer cells, on the AIDS cells, on other cells. And all the devices up to that point were torturous to use. 
They were fraught with peril. They would often break down. They, people couldn't understand the software. You required days and days and days of training to be able to do the simplest things with them. And our clients said, we want to create a personal flow cytometer. We want it on desktops, not in central lab facilities. We want it easy enough for not just the principal investigators to use, but their grad students to use. That was a big challenge. And I remember one time I was walking out of a hardware store on a Saturday morning doing my weekend warrior work. And I had that company's logo shirt on that morning, just happened to be my work shirt that day, but it was the logo of our customer. And this customer in the parking lot sees it, walks across, points to my shirt and said, I use that product every day. I love that product. And I said, oh, we did the software for it. He says, you did? You did a great job. You made my life so much better. Thank you. That is joy. That's how we can get to joy in our work. And we can do that in any context. My daughter bought this fan the other day from a company called Vornado. You just get it online. And it broke. She called up the customer service people and they treated her so well. It was such a shock to her. They sent her a replacement that day. It showed up. It was the wrong color. They screwed up. She called them up and said, hey, guys, thanks for the fan. But oh, by the way, it's the wrong color there. OK, sorry. We'll ship you a new one. By the way, just keep the one with the wrong color. Don't even worry about it. And she's like, Phew. and you know what she does? She tells all of her friends about it, tells her parents about it. I have a Vornado fan now, <laughs> right? And it's a simple, I mean, it's like Tony Shea, right? Tony didn't even particularly care for shoes. I met Tony at Zappos when I was on our tour there. He wasn't even wearing shoes. He walked around the office barefoot. He didn't care about shoes. He cared about delivering happiness to the people he served. That was his purpose in life. And Zappos takes off like a rocket right? And deservedly so. They took great care of their clients. They knew what people needed. They broke all the rules. Well, we're not going to charge for shipping. We're not going to charge for returns. I can imagine all the business people out there. Are you crazy? People will abuse that system. He says, I don't care. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to take a different approach because I know what my clients need and I'm going to deliver that to them no matter what. Uh, and if we develop those spirits and attitudes in our businesses, we could change the world. Definitely, you can change the world 100%. I, I, I love that um, uh, your stories and the way you explain that so eloquently. Um, there, there's more questions about, you know, you, you made this comment, um, or I did in your biography, but you also touched upon it, that <clears throat> joy is not just possible, but it's essential. It's essential to profitability, productivity, and every measure of success. And uh, I, I use something very similar that sustainability or environmental social governance uh, systems thinking in business is, is essential to uh, do the true value, the true cost, the total environmental cost and, and those things. And that is essential, but it's also a measurement of success, it's a measurement of profitability that uh, if you apply those things, those organizations and those companies that had applied them before the pandemic or apply them a few years ago before we started getting all this terminology and talk about uh, the climate crisis and an environment and biodiversity loss, that they were able to weather the pandemic and the storms and, and the problems a lot better and then during situations like this, uh, like the pandemic, they were able to pivot on a dime and deliver essential services, digital services to people during the pandemic, food services to create respirators, to, to do things, and that their stocks, believe it or not, their um, sustainable index funds, stocks and investments and divestments all went up during this time. So it, it was, you know, before that you talk about sustainability or joy or, or this, you know, these, these core uh, principles in business and how, how you do uh, that, uh, your organization, run your organization, 
oh, that could be costly. Do we really want to switch to that model? Uh, is it profitable? You know, it's hard to do. We're going to have to make a lot of investments. Um, and now people are, are knocking down the door saying that that is a better model. And, and guess what? My employees are still joyful, happy there to sustain oneself means to be around for future generations to have enough to pay your employees to have an organization that is going to be around in the hard times and be not just around uh, squeaking by but one to help your family your employees your organization um, to give them a better view and your customers as well and so i hear when you, when you speak about these topics i hear all of those things out and the very first way I started the podcast, Inside Ideas, this podcast, was with the good friend of mine, John P. Strelecki, uh, out of Florida. He wrote uh, numerous books. Uh, he's really famous in, in Europe, but he, he lives in America. He wrote The Why Cafe, or The Cafe at the Edge of the uh, Earth, and uh, Big Five for Life, and The Big Five Continued, Big Five for Life Continued, and uh, numerous other books and uh, sells in, in Europe anyway, and especially in Germany, sells a book every 26 minutes. And in, in that book, it's also falls in line with all these other books that we're talking about. He has a thing, it's, it's not uh, really the why or the how, it's the who. Who out there is successful in doing what you wanna do or the way you wanna live, and let's find that person, that who, and that's why I found you to give us the stories of how we can do it and how we can use that as an example to follow you as a who, who's doing it to not reinvent the wheel, but to help us with that knowledge and that learning like the Tony Shays, like the uh, uh, Tony Robbins and Richard Branson's or whoever are our mentor or view of successful business uh, people, but also people who are successfully doing good for the planet, doing good for business. And um, that, that uh, in his book, he talks about purpose for existing. He also talks about this, have you had a, a museum day today? So he looks back at a certain amount of days on this earth and how you have these mu museum day moments. And in your, the stories of joy in your company in Menlo, you, uh, I'm hearing there's a lot of those similar principles, but in a different culture, in a different perspective, in a different tone or wording the way they're presented. And I'd love to hear those stories. One thing that I, I would like to hear more of is what sustainability aspects, what resilience aspects do you have in those models as well that you maybe could share with us that are, are really um, what your thoughts and feelings are about being sustainable and resilient for the planet and and the future of work and those things involved in this whole concept of joy and Menlo. Yeah, and I think whenever the topic turns to sustainability, right, we think about the environment, we think about energy sources, we think about um, uh, the systems at work around those pieces. And I will tell you, uh, typically what we're most concerned about is needless waste of energy. Right? That is typically what happens is, is it renewable? Is it sustainable? And are we simply wasting it, right? Well, I think one of the most wasted energy sources on the planet is human energy. Gallup has been measuring disengagement statistics for the last 50 years, 60, 70, 80% of people disengaged at work. Yep. I mean, really? Like, can you imagine the waste inside of that? All of these people getting in their cars, driving to their office, parking in a parking place, walking down the quarter, sitting down going, well, it's just a job. I'm here to collect my paycheck, right? And what if we could flip that equation? What kind of efficiency could we gain in our human organizations simply by flipping that equation? What if we went from 70% disengaged to 70% positively engaged. Now, the delightful thing is I've actually seen this at work. I give talks around the world and one of the messages I deliver, it, when people hear me speak, they can get excited. They can, they can walk away thinking, I can change the world. And they go to the office the next day and they say, I have a new idea. 
And somebody said, that won't work here. That's against policy. We tried that 10 years ago. It didn't work then. It won't work now. And the ideas typically die in the vine right then and there, don't they? And I arm my audiences with a simple message. Look them in the eye and say, get it. But why don't we try it before we defeat it? Let's run the experiment and see what happens. Instead of thinking of all the things that could go wrong, let's try it and see if anything does go wrong. And if it does, maybe we correct it and move forward. Now, that simple phrase alone can replace meetings and policy writing and committees because now we just go run experiments. And I will tell you, I gave this talk to a, a 180 year old life insurance company named Mass Mutual here in the States. Big organization, $30 billion a year in annual sales. And Amy Ferrero, their VP of claims, took that message to heart. And she started running experiments with her team of thousands of claim processors. And she invited me back six months later to show me what had happened. And she said, Rich, we're going to go see claims. This big 100,000 square foot facility, half height cubicles, everybody sitting there processing beneficiary claims on life insurance policies every single day. They pay out $3 billion a year in claims a year. And um, she said, Rich, when we get there, you're going to see helium balloons. I said, oh, okay, well, are you celebrating something? She goes, no, everywhere there's a desk with a helium balloon taped to it. The person at that desk is making a declaration and an invitation. The declaration is I'm running an experiment. The invitation is come ask me about it. I'm like, wow. And I'm thinking, so where'd you come up with that, Amy? You didn't hear that from me. I didn't talk about healing balloons, but there she does. She ran the experiment, right? We turn the corner, Mark, and there are balloons as far as the eye can see. You want to talk about evidence of human energy? So I run up to Susan's desk. I said, Susan, tell me about your experiment. She says, well, let me tell you, I'm in charge of quality. I said, what does that mean? She says, I'm the last stop before the check gets cut. I have to do three checks to make sure this is the right amount, the right person it's going to, and, you know, and everything's clearly paid up policy, all that kind of stuff. She says, I got step A, step B, and step C. She says, the problem is, what I saw was, if I find an error at step C, I have to go back and redo step B. And step B is the longest part of the process. And the order doesn't matter. So my experiment is do A and then C and then B. Okay, now, not a big deal, right? I mean, it sounds pretty simple. And she is just beaming with energy, telling me this. She's so excited. And I said, Susan, how long have you worked here? She says, 19 years. And I said, have you always been like this? And her face literally turned into a scowl. She said, no. I hated my job before. I hated coming to work. I dreaded the drive-in. I was counting the days to retirement. I said, well, what's different now? She says, now we can run experiments. I said, what was it like before? She said, Rich, every idea I ever brought to work had to go up five levels, over, down five levels. Every idea I ever brought died on the vine. After a while, you know what? You just stop bringing ideas. You declare to yourself, you know, it's just a job. Find your joy elsewhere. Find it outside of work. Count the days to retirement. She says, now I love my job. I can't wait to get here. I'm not even thinking about retirement anymore. One human being inside that organization, and there are balloons as far as the eye can see. Can you imagine the conservation, not only of human energy, but all the energy of the meetings, the paperwork that would flow back and forth and so on, the simplification of an organization of that size and nature. And I have seen this happen in so many different places I've touched. I think there's a huge upside to this, not only for the human energy, but for every other source of energy that drives our human organizations. I totally, I totally agree. I mean, I, I speak a lot about global citizens and it's really uh, that it's about human capital. We humans are the ones who are having this global society we transcend borders and nations and and we take our value and and the way we serve and act and enjoy our work all around the world um it's, it can't be done um in any other way and so i really uh, I, I like how how you express that and and that beautiful story i just wish you guys would come and over to germany here we, we need a lot of help so 
the customer are, service in Germany say, is hard, are, hard to find. <laughs> there are a lot of German companies that have come to us. Uh, it's a uh, it's a tougher nut to crack with the German companies. Not impossible, mind you, but you know, there's a. I will say what I see is there is a lot of pride in German companies, and I think that's well deserved. There's been a lot of things that have been accomplished in, uh, to a great degree, but I think there's also a lot of uh, you know, what I see is a little bit of spirit of, well, you know what, we've got a job to do. We we don't need to care that much about our people. We just need to forge ahead and get the job done. Mm -hmm. My message to them is you can get there a lot faster with even, you know, more efficiently, more effectively deliver better results and have a happier workforce. And wouldn't that be worth it? Because the other thing you're going to get out of this, fewer sick days, fewer days where people just call in and say, I can't make it today. Fewer days where people are coming to work, but they aren't actually there. Fewer people who quit in place. You know, they didn't actually quit. They're still collecting a paycheck. They're taking up space in your office, but mentally they've left their brain on the pillow at home. Yeah. I mean, these are huge benefits to organizations that have tremendous costs. It's just hidden. It's insidious costs, right? That's the same in John P. Strelecki's book, Big Five for Life, talks about the same thing. Businesses uh, or organizations don't realize the, the, the true cost to hire an employee, but the true cost to lose an employee and to have someone continue to work there who is unsatisfied and what detriment that can have on your organization. Um, I want to get into uh, just a few more questions, kind of probably the hardest questions that I have for you today. Um, and that is the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? <laughs> you know, um, you, you had mentioned in the beginning and it kind of caught my attention that some of the people you have interviewed uh, over the years have been futurists. One of the books that had a great impact on me back in 1982 was John Naisbitt's book, Megatrends. And the quote I grabbed out of that that I give in most of my talks today is from Naisbitt. And I think it is more applicable today than it's ever been. He said, the biggest breakthroughs of the 21st century, the one we're in right now. Now, remember, Naisbitt wrote this in 1982. I just, I gotta, I, I hope I get a chance to meet him someday because I know he's getting old. Uh, and I would just love the chance to at least thank him for, uh, for this. I just wrote a blog post about him, actually, uh, that got published this week. But he said the biggest breakthroughs that are going to occur in the 21st century are not going to occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And I think that's where we're at right now. I see it in our own team. You know, when we all went to work from home and, and lost the part where we're all together every day, I worried about the relationships of our team members. I worried about the time we were spending together. Well, we're still spending together. This is what Menlo work looks like. We literally pair people at Menlo. So no one's ever isolated or alone. And I think that construct of Menlo, pairing two people together, is more important now than it's ever been. Right, because think of the loneliness and isolation that people are having in the work from home environment. And we don't have that. We're, we always have a pair partner when we're working. But what's yeah. more interesting to me is that now we're seeing into the lives of people. We see their cats, their dogs, their kids, the books on the shelf behind them, the paintings from their grandfather they can talk about. We're getting a better feeling for the humans who work for us than we've ever had when they were in the office as colleagues. Now they're humans. Now they're fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers and dog owners and cat owners. We get to see all of them. We see their kids show up. I, I was doing an interview or panel with a group included a CEO from a company in Dusseldorf that I know quite well. And the CEO's there from his home like I am. And his four-year-old son walks up to him. And without missing a beat, without even hesitating, he just grabs his four-year-old son, plops him on his lap, continues the interview. 
mean, what a beautiful sight for a CEO to embrace his family like that in front of a worldwide audience. What a message to send to your team to say, no, it's okay. You have a family. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't try and hide it. Embrace it. I, think this, is, I think this is the future. This oh. is the this is the opportunity that rests inside of a terrible event that's happened in 2020. And yeah. let's not lose it. Let's not lose this opportunity because it's right there for us to grab. I love it. So uh, what you probably didn't know is I interviewed Doris Nesbitt, John's wife, last week on the podcast, and it'll uh, it'll air in about three weeks. But um, uh, John, he's 91 years old. He d he doesn't uh, speak anymore. So it's, it's getting a big struggle. But I will relay that message to him. Um, uh, we actually if spoke. I send you the article I wrote. Can yeah. you forward it on to him? I definitely will. I'll, do, I'll forward it on to the both end, of them. It just them. simply says thank you for yeah. writing this, and and I apologize for how long it took me to understand the importance of what he had written back in 1982. Yeah, I definitely will. So, I mean, Thomas Yuli is a, a, a good friend of mine who I also had on the podcast. He referred to you uh, to, for me to speak to you and have you on the podcast. He also uh, is um, uh, a good friend that we know each other from Davos and the World Economic Forum and some other organizations. But he also in his book has that same quote from, from John. And, and I mentioned to Doris that, that uh, there's a lot of people out there who um, really love uh, the work that they did, their stories, and not just mega trends, but their other uh, books and, and their foundation and things, works that they've done after that fact. And, and in reality, they're, they're uh, not only futurists, but they're trends. They're, they're, think about the trends of the future, mega trends. And um, uh, a good friend of mine, Niels Miller from Trend One, who's here in Hamburg, He's the one uh, we speak about trends. He does a lot about trends. And he says, you know, we should contact John and, and Doris and kind of have a, a time with them and speak to them about things. And uh, the interesting thing is the overarching theme of uh, is not only these mega trends, but the mega trends are really tied to culture of humanity, how cultures work, how human beings work, and how... Um, the evolution of culture is the fastest evolutionary change that humanity can take. For humanity to have an evolutionary change would take millions of years, maybe billions of years. Um, uh, but to have a, a human cultural shift or change can, can take us on another evolution type of a, of a spring in a much shorter amount of time. Still takes a long time. But they touch upon some of those things in the book. And, and, and I really, it was so great that you mentioned that. I'll definitely say, say hello to you, uh, to him for you and pass that article on. Um, the last three questions that I have for you are actually uh, self, selfish takeaways. And, and I don't think you'll mind for my listeners because you have a lot of people come uh, virtually now to your offices and and you're willing to speak to them. It's basically um, messages that will they, they could take or apply or words of wisdoms from you and from Menlo um, that you could depart to them. And, and uh, the first one is, if there was uh, one message that you could depart to my listeners that was a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? You know, I, I draw a picture these days comparing the forces at work on a human organization and the forces at work on an aircraft. The lift of human energy, the weight of bureaucracy, the thrust of purpose, and the drag of fear. And if we're going to get our organizational aircraft off the ground every day, we better create more human energy than bureaucracy and more purpose than fear. And that simple model has really resonated with a lot of people. But then I make it personal and I say, look, when that pilot points the aircraft down the runway, gives it full throttle, and it hits takeoff speed, they make this very simple little move on the yoke. They pull it back just a little bit, creating an angle between the nose of the aircraft and the earth. And that simple angle is all that it takes to get your organizational aircraft off the ground. And the name that 
they use in aeronautical engineering is positive attitude. And this is available to all of us literally the second you hear it. You get to choose your own attitude. You get to choose what attitude you bring to life. And you can choose a positive attitude or a negative attitude. If you want to get the people around you off the ground, be that force that you want to see in the world. Be that positive force. It's your choice. And, you know, it's not always easy, given all the stuff that's filling our main minds these days from Twitter and Facebook and all the other inputs of the terrible things that are going on in the world. But guard that part of yourself. Guard your spirit. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful what you fill your mind with. Yes, there are stuff we shouldn't avoid looking at because it's too hard to think about and that sort of thing. That's just life. But don't revel in it. Don't make that your sole existence. Choose positivity. Choose that positive attitude and you can lift yourself and others around you. Beautiful. What are two to three actions and every citizen, every human being or decision maker can take to help accelerate the impact um, in their field or uh, um, to accelerate an impact and what they want to do? You know, I was, uh, I was brought up in scouting and that was a big deal for me. And one of the things we were taught was always leave the campsite a little better than you found it. And so, you know, a lot of people get frustrated because they think I don't have the position to change the world. You don't have to change the world. You just have to change your world. Leave this campsite we call planet Earth just a little better than you found it. And if we all adopt that as individuals, we can make a huge change in the world. A good friend of mine who runs an amazing company here in Ann Arbor, somebody you should also interview, Ari Weinzweig from Zingerman's. He's been at this entrepreneurial journey 20 years longer than me runs an amazingly cultural focused organization here in Ann Arbor. He said, you know, when he walks down the sidewalk and he sees a piece of litter, he always picks it up, puts it in the garbage can. He says, why wouldn't you? This is my home. It's where I live. I wouldn't leave this in, in my living room. I, why would I leave it on a sidewalk walking around downtown Ann Arbor? Shortly after that, I'm walking right near their deli that's very famous here in Ann Arbor. And there was this huge bag of trash sitting in the middle of the street. I think what had happened is a garbage truck had dumped the canister in, but one of them fell off and it was just sitting in the middle of the road filled with papers and napkins and plates and all that kind of stuff. And the first car that hit it would have spread it out to the wind. And here's this bag just sitting there. And I thought of Ari and thought, no, it's my responsibility. Pick up that bag, put it in the garbage can. The beautiful coincidence of that was it was a bag filled with garbage from Ari's company, Zingerman's. And it's like it all came full circle for me. This is our place. This is the only place we got. Let's take care of it. That's beautiful. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you say, I wish I would have known that from the start? You know, I think what I learned over the years is when you have these crazy ideas that things can be better, don't be discouraged. Don't let go of them. Hang on to those things. Write them down because, in fact, they're probably the best ideas you ever have. Pay attention to those ideas you have just before falling asleep or just before waking in the morning and starting your day because it's often in those cusp moments of end of day, beginning of day that we have these dreams about how things can be better. Hang on to those, write them down. Don't let go of them, pursue them. You can make that kind of change. And it's, it's not as unavailable as it seems at first. You know, um, that's all the questions I have for you, but I, I really want to kind of uh, make it even a little bit more clear for my listeners. You know, I, I'm big on sustainable innovations. I run the innovation hub at Davos and, and I, I, innovation is important. Um, I haven't asked you a lot of innovation questions, but I think the, the, the principles, the joys, the stories that you've told us applied to anything that we wanna do for innovations for purpose and in, impact innovations for good purpose of for humanity to make things better are all things that come out in our journey and our discussion today 
But if you were to say one last thing uh, before we end our conversation around innovation, would you would you have anything to say that we haven't touched upon today that is important for my listeners to hear? The biggest threat to innovation is the biggest threat to humanity, and it is fear. Fear is the mind killer, as uh, Frank Herbert said in Dune. Fear is the part that shuts down the most human part of our brain. When we go into fear, we are turned into reptiles. We are down to the amygdala. We're, we're in fight or flight mode. We, we don't, we're not thinking straight. If we can, as leaders, create organizations that diminish that fear as much as possible, and most of the fear we can diminish is the artificial fear we create in order to motivate other people, right? Raised eyebrow at a meeting, the heave of a sigh, I thought you were the person to do this job, I guess I was wrong. All the things, dumb things we say as leaders. If we can back off from that fear equation, we will keep the humans who work for us in that most human place. And in that part of our brain, that works when we're not afraid, when we feel safe, is where creativity, imagination, invention, and innovation come from. And that's why, again, back to John Naisbitt, that the most important breakthroughs of this century are going to occur because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. That's where our humanity lies, in creativity and innovation. And we as leaders need to recognize that and recognize the things we're doing as leaders that diminish that ability for humans to innovate around us. Because when we innovate as humans, it's the most delightful thing we ever see. The music, the dance, the art, the creations of humanity are delightful things to see. And we know this, we knew this when we were kindergartners. We know it today as adults with just a faint memory of what it used to be like when we were so young and creative and unafraid. We need to get back to that place for all of us. My uh, podcast episode number 42 was uh, Jeff DeGraff. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I know Jeff very well. You, you, Jeff wrote about me in his book, Creativity. Yeah, yeah the creative mindset. And uh, yeah, there's uh, so um, I, I knew we were in good company when we were discussing, but I, I just think it's it's really extremely interesting that I've, you know, within not even two months, I've, I've interviewed two people from Michigan, you know, uh, what's the coincidence of that? I'm in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, I've also had a couple of people on that keep mentioning John Naisbitt, uh, not only Niels Miller and uh, um, Thomas Yuli, but there's just, uh, you know, it, it is, it is amazing. And it's been a sheer joy. I just wanted to, to thank you um, for your time. And, and I hope we can follow up again when uh, things don't get back to normal, but when we can emerge from this much differently and stronger and kind of see how things are going and, and, uh, and touch bases with you again and get an update. I really appreciate your time, Rich, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Well, this has been a delightful conversation, so thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.